Well, um, I guess we'll get started since it's three o'clock. I think some people will come in, but they don't have to listen to me. Um, I am Georgia Warnke. For those of you who don't know me, I am director of the Center for Ideas and Society. And um, we are very pleased to have Randy Head here as part of our uh, Hot Off the Presses um, sessions in which uh, UCR faculty present their uh, recently published books. Um, since we've moved to the online format, uh, we do it slightly differently. We um, ask somebody to interview the author um, so that it's a little bit more lively in the Zoom environment. So I'm going to introduce Jim Brennan and then he's gonna introduce uh, Randy and conduct the interview in the session. Um, so Jim Brennan, as you all know, this is one of the things I do as director of the center. I introduce people to people who already know them. Uh, Jim Brennan is a professor of history, um, specializing in Martin, uh, modern Latin American history uh, with a focus on indus industry and labor. Um, he's also interested in Latin American left, political violence, human rights, um, 20th century revolution. He's written three books, and most importantly of all, he is a member of the advisory committee of the center. So Jim, do you want to take over? I guess, in fact, this is my first uh, official act as a member of the faculty committee here in the center. Uh, well, thank, thanks for inviting me uh, to do this. I'm very happy to do it, and welcome to you all. Uh, uh, my understanding of, of the center's hot off the presses series is to present to the university community at large, and I guess others are, are able to join us as well, um, not only uh, new faculty authored books, but also ones that are particularly noteworthy, um, major contributions to the discipline. And that certainly seems to be a, a, an accurate description of Professor Randy Head's new book. I'll hold it up for you to see if you have not seen it. Um, Making Archives in Early Modern Europe, Proof, Information, and Political Record Keeping, 1400 to 1700. Um, published by Cambridge University Press last year. Uh, you know, I have the habit of reading my colleagues' books in the history department. They don't know that, uh, but I do. If they're on subjects that I find interesting and crucially know nothing about, I don't think they read my books, but I do selectively read theirs. And Randy's book, when I uh, saw it, last year, it uh, fit the bill. Uh, it looked interesting and I know absolutely nothing about archival history. Uh, my own field, which is, a, as Georgia mentioned, is uh, Latin American history. And it seems largely to be absent from uh, the new archival history and its debates. So a little bit, there's some faint signs of it in colonial Latin American history. I have a friend from graduate school, Randy, you may know her and her book, Catherine Burns, who wrote a book into the archive. Fantastic book. Yeah. yeah, yeah. She's one of the few people I know uh, who, who are interested in these questions. I think in the modern Latin American field, which is I work on, there, there, there's, there's no one. Uh, and so Randy's subject caught my attention uh, immediately, and it was utterly new. And it makes eminent sense. The more, after I read the book and thought a, a lot about it, I think one of the signs of a great book is it makes you think about uh, new questions and think about history a different way. There aren't many books that do that. Randy's was, is one that did. I read it over the summer, early in the summer, and I was thinking about it off and on all summer long. <laughs> uh, so it, it uh, had an impact on me. And, you know, it, again, it, it makes eminent sense that uh, we turn to the archive. It is uh, the historian's lab. As, uh, it's essential that we understand its, its history, but also assumptions about uh, what historical knowledge is. Uh, we don't keep the records. We don't uh, maintain them. So historicizing the archive, I think, in all kinds of ways, uh, on many levels is, is absolutely vital. Now, I don't know if you know, I'm not going to talk too much, you're here to hear, hear uh, Randy, but I don't know if, if you all know Randy as well as I do. I think a lot of you, a lot, I see a number of you from the department, but perhaps you don't, so let me introduce you to him. Uh, he's been one of the mainstays in the history department for many years. He's been longer here even than I have, which I've been here 25 years. His work uh, focuses on early modern Europe, especially the German-speaking parts of Europe, uh, he's an historian of political culture, religious conflict, and other subjects. And then in recent years, uh, turns his attention to the history of archives and record keeping. He's the author of several books. I'm not going to rattle them off here since we have limits of time. His most recent book is a, a History of Switzerland, also published with Cambridge. I think from 
what I gather from talking to friends who work in European history, he is the leading English speaking historian of Switzerland. Um, uh, the the book is, is really uh, a mon mon monumental research project uh, in, involving archival research in, in half a dozen countries, uh, including, I was delighted to see as an Iberianist, Portugal, which is a country uh, European is usually ignore completely, <laughs> but uh, Randy has it a story. Um, and, uh, and the labors that went into the book, among the many of the things that impressed me, just the labors that went in, you know, dealing with six different, or half a dozen different archives, different archival staffs, different archivists, uh, various languages, uh, German, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, um, it just, um, it, 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 it was sort of astoundingly, breathtakingly, in my, I, I thought, uh, book, just in terms of the labors that went into it, in addition to the, to, uh, again, for me, the, uh, the new vistas that opened up and the, and the way it had me thinking about, my last book was on uh, human rights in Argentina. And I started thinking about, you know, the sort of the whole politics of the human rights archive, archives that have been developed by human rights organizations and the government. And there's a history about, those archives, it could be written, I'm thinking maybe I'll write it, in fact. Uh, so it, you know, it, it, uh, it, the project itself, I thought, uh, it very much merited a, a one, of, one of these off the press. I told Brandy, this is, I think, as I understand it, we, we play kind of loose here, informal, kind of, it's kind of a book signing without the book and without the signing, just to talk a little bit about the book. And, and here, uh, yeah, we thought we'd start off with uh, Randy just telling the story of the project itself, how, how it came to be. And then from there, I don't want to be an, an, an interrogator. Uh, I, I'd like us all to ask, I have questions, but I'm sure others will as well. So um, I, I think more, a, better, a better, better format is, is for all, uh, us all to be involved in some way, but I certainly will ask questions. But let me turn it over to Randy. Well, thank you very much, Jim. And I'd also like to thank uh, Georgia uh, and Catherine Henshaw and Renee at the center who always are supporting us in so many different ways. Uh, so thank you all. And thank you so much for coming. Um, the story of the book uh, it truly is one of those unexpected moments. Uh, this is a book that I did not expect to write. It was not on my agenda. I had broadly told myself, well, I'm going to write a book about a Swiss canton, which was my dissertation, and then I'm going to write a book about Swiss institutional culture, that being my area of fascination, which will be my second, and the third ought to be European. Uh, just as a trajectory, one ought to widen one's view as one moves along through a career. But I never expected it to be like this. Uh, I was in the mid-1990s hard at work on what I thought was going to be my second book, which never happened, uh, and confronted a problem of political culture, of institutional culture, of how to get at um, the way that early modern Swiss political actors understood what they were doing. Uh, Switzerland is notorious, for those of you who know anything about its history, for its complexity and particularity. It's all very precise. It is what it is, and it's messy, and there are very few clear rules, yet it seemed to have developed a very distinctive and quite strong political culture, one whose resonances down to the present are actually quite powerful, and is seen, for example, in the way that populism emerged in Switzerland quite early. Uh, this latest wave of populism came first in Switzerland because it fit very well with this a very durable political culture that had emerged there. Um, so I was pursuing a, a question of institutional culture, which had to do how, how certain anomalous territories were understood by the key political actors. And I, you know, there, there's very few memoirs. There's not much in the way of diaries. And uh, the political documentation is, tends to be fairly superficial. A lot was done face to face, all the important things. So how do I get at this? And it occurred to me that one way to see how they thought about things might be to ask where they put things in the archive, right? How did they archive? I did this uh, with a typical, certainly typical for my generation of historian, complete ignorance of how archives work. And I, I can't overstate that, right? Uh, archives were a place you went and well, there were various catalogs and tools and there were archivists and they got you the documents and the documents is where our work began. And that's very much how I was thinking at that point. Um, and I really have to, you know, one of my first thanks, shout outs besides to uh, the people who have supported the project directly is all the, uh, the, 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 the last generation of archival theorists and archival scientists who have really um, rewritten their discipline in a way that make, raises important challenges for historians. Anyway, there I was, I was working one summer in Zurich. 
I was in the state archive. And so I went to the, the archivist, of course, and said, have you got any old inventories? I'm curious where the people in Zurich cataloged the subject cherries, the Gemeine Herrschaften, they're called the shared subject cherries. How did they, how did they keep track of them? And they said, well, over there on a shelf, right in the reading room, not, an, not a source, of course, is a catalog of the archive from uh, 1646. Johann Heinrich Waser, at that time the city secretary, had done a big reorganization project. You ought to have just what you want. This catalog, it's a pretty thick book, uh, folio format, small, over quarto format, not huge, um, was one of the most fascinating sources I've ever found. I read it and my eyes just got, oh, this is fantastic. Wow. <laughs> um, it is, I think I was seduced at first by the visible, a manifest effort at classification uh, that it contained. Classification is something that is always tempting, at least I've always found it interesting. How do we organize the world into categories? Well, this was classification done sort of beautifully and transparently and lucidly, and it had a long 20-page manuscript introduction, uh, which is very uncommon, I've since found, in this kind of document. So by stumbling upon this particular inventory, uh, that I've seen many uh, archival inventories from the early modern period since then. And most of them, frankly, if I had run into them, I would have said, oh my God, I can't, I, what do I do with this? Right? They're lists. They're, they're the most boring documents you can imagine. They're certainly not sources, are they? But this one, I found a great one. And that really is what launched this project. I had a paper to write that summer. There was a conference coming up and I had to talk about something. Uh, my other project was stuck. And so I wrote a paper about that inventory. Index Archivorum Generalis of 1646. Uh, it was well received, the paper was well received, people encouraged me. And then in another uh, incredible sort of stumbling of luck, I kept working on the other project for years, uh, some years, uh, but I think about, must have been about 2002 or 2003, uh, I worked up this material for a bigger paper, which was lucky enough to get into the uh, Journal of Modern History, uh, found some really wonderful historian slash archivists um, whose work, and they were mostly, these were actually people, the most important came out of the archival sphere, uh, working on Savoy, working on other regions around there. Uh, Peter Rook is the most important of these. That really got me fascinated and drew, drew me into this subject. Uh, second complete stab of luck, uh, I reached out to a colleague, uh, Anne Blair, uh, who was working on a book at that time, which I didn't know, called Too Much to Know about early modern knowledge management. Uh, and I reached out to her because on her teaching website, she had listed that she taught a course about Switzerland. And I thought that was sort of interesting. And I was in Washington at the UCDC that year, that, that, that winter or that fall. And she was coming to the AHA, which was there and we decided to have breakfast. And over breakfast, it turns out she was organizing a conference about the history of archives. And I had just gotten accepted an article on the history of archives. That in turn led me uh, really critically to uh, one of the great intellectual leaders of the new archival history, uh, an archivist by training, a trainer of archivists. This is Eric Ketelaar, former national uh, archivist of the Netherlands, uh, former professor of archivistics at uh, Amsterdam University and one of the most generous human beings I've had the privilege to work with. Uh, so it took off, it took off. Um, it wasn't a fast project. I, as you can see, the dates I'm talking about, 1990s to early 2000s. Um, uh, and with various interruptions though, and with you know, some very generous fellowship support to spend time in, in Europe, uh, I was able to gather this set of cases. Um, the other interesting sort of co-evolution that I found happening is that when I started, one of the first things I did is I better understand, you know, what archivists and archival research is about. And I did sort of a systematic scan of the older archival journals. Uh, and nobody was doing this. I didn't know, I mean, there was some interesting work just coming out then, um, Nicholas Dirks and, and um, people, uh, uh, people uh, and Ann Stoller uh, working on colonial archives. And that's been a very important part of this field's evolution. But especially on Europe, there was really not much. And the archival journals I found, you know, from the 80s and 90s, really were in the mode, you know, an interesting document from Lesser Hinder Wigglesworth or, you know, the photocopier threat or menace, uh, the, 
archival literature didn't seem to be addressing these bigger questions. There was a gap. And I think that was a state or condition at the, say, 1990, that archivistics as a discipline and history as a discipline had really wandered about as far apart as they could. Historians were not being trained uh, in the, even the elementary understanding of how archives worked. You were expected, certainly at Virginia where I got my PhD, you were expected to head off and figure it out. And archivists more and more had become uh, information management specialists. They were employed by governments and firms and corporations. And they, the tr older tradition of being trained as historians was fading away, although not entirely, especially in Europe. Uh, but you know, historians were clients, uh, not partners. That has changed in the past 25 years in really positive ways. And I was lucky enough to start my project just as that stage change was happening. And as an other, a number of other really terrific scholars, so Anne Blair with too much to know, uh, Felipe de Vivo, who is at Birkbeck, who worked on the Venetian archives, just astonishingly lucid uh, uh, representation of what was going on in Venice. Um, uh, the ar archivist at Simancas, uh, who I had the privilege to meet while he was still in office, uh, still uh, running the archive in Simancas in, in 2007, Jose Luis Rodrigo de Diego. Um, again, one of these incredibly generous people who welcomed me, pressed a copy of Philip II's Guide to the Archive into my hand that he had produced an edition of, took me on the tour to all the back rooms of the archive in Simancas you know, on 10 minutes notice, uh, just extraordinary. Uh, and that's really the genesis of the project. So it has grown together with really a new field. I, I think that it, what Jim was saying, it, it's fair to say that in the mid nineties, there wasn't much work on archives as a site of research, uh, as, a subject of, as a subject of research rather than a site. And by 2015, I think it's a quite common thing. And we find both people working in archivistics, archival science and historians who see that as an important part of a complete historical project. So that's the story of the book, if I can. Um, and I think I should just stop and wait for more questions. Well, I'll, I'll start off the questions. I don't want to talk too much shop here because not everyone's an historian. I think most a number of my colleagues are here, but um, and method, uh, methodologically, how, how this project is different. Actually, let me ask you a more specific question because as I read the re re related methodology, sort of on the, the culture of, archival access in Europe. You know, as I, as, I, as I read your book, I'm hearing you again, and I heard you talk about this before in the department, uh, comparing it to, to Latin America, I always joke, uh, the, 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 the archival culture in Latin America, I haven't worked in every country, but I've worked in the big three in Argentina, uh, Brazil, and Mexico. Uh, it, it's the tres lagajos por día rule. There's three bundles per, per, a day, per day rule which it literally was in Argentina when I did my doctoral re research. You've got three legajos, three bundles or files. Um, that was your quota for the day. And uh, when you were, if there was nothing there, you were done for the day. That's all you had. You could plead, you could bribe, you could try anything, it would, wouldn't work. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the archive in, in Latin America, I mean, these are, the attitude is these are sort of state secrets. It's the national patrimony. Access is considered a, a privilege and it's closely controlled and carefully watched. And I got the impression, and again, from hearing you a little bit, you almost had a kind of a free reign in these archives or, or, or not, maybe not unlimited access, but considerable access. Now, now these, you know, these in Europe, these are more democratic open cultures, of course, but I, 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 I think it'd be very difficult to, to, to get the kind of access I'm going long on here, but it's a simple question. <laughs> sort right, of on, right, right, right. And, and the culture of, of, of archival access in Europe, is it is it as open as it sounds in, in, in each of these countries? And uh, are, are, are well, I, I think, Jim, I would say is that there was something of a, a trajectory involved and it varied in each case. So there were certain archivists like uh, Rodriguez de Diego, uh, Simancas, the office of archivist, at least up until him was hereditary. His mother was the archivist before him. Uh, so he came from a long line of archivists and had as a scholar, and he's a very significant scholar of uh, Philippine uh, Spain of, uh, under Philip II, uh, had already been moving in this direction of working as a historian of the archive. So he was extraordinarily welcoming and was like, thank you, finally someone's come to do this, right? They, they, they see this as something. And, and uh, 
the sense of state secret and national patrimony, I think, in Western Europe, and I would say probably Western Europe, uh, is, of course, by now, I think, fairly passé. Uh, there's not going to be any shocking revelations from inventories 600 years ago. <laughs> They're pretty confident on that front. Uh, another example, the, the three, three items per day, which does apply in many of the largest archives in Europe, uh, absolutely. Um, I actually ran up a grant against that in Vienna, the Haushof und Staatsarchiv. Um, I had fortunately bumped into the director at a conference. <laughs> there you go, one of these coincidences again. Uh, and uh, he had introduced me to his staff. And the, so I would go and I said, well, I, I, I want to look at all the, they have, they have a lot of old inventories there. And I was looking at a lot of them. I looked almost exclusively at inventories, not at documents. Although sometimes there's documents around the inventories. Uh, what the Europeans call the archive of the archive yeah. uh, is, was sometimes quite important. Anyway, so the people at the reading room desk in the House of Staatsarchiv made an ad hoc decision that inventories are not sources. So I can look at as many as I want. Yeah. And that was fairly typical. Uh, you know, often it was generational. Uh, Innsbruck, which turned out to be a treasure trove, an absolutely fantastic and revealing uh, archive. Um, the director there was quite cool and uh, well, yes, okay, I suppose you could come look at this stuff, but why would you want to do that? Um, but his assistant was very helpful <laughs> to the point where uh, one time I'd actually booked my tickets, booked a, a booked a Airbnb in Innsbruck and got a message saying, we're terribly sorry, but we have on the short notice, we have to close the reading room uh, to do to, uh, put in handicapped access. And this is the only time the contractor can do it. And we're very sorry, but we're going to be closed. I wrote back and said, but I bought tickets, you know, I have an apartment rented. And the assistant director said, we'll work something out. And he sent me up my own private office with a person on call to bring me things uh, because he thought it was a good project. So I can say that the access in Western European archives was, once they had figured the project out, was generally very supportive. Um, uh, when I arrived, uh, oh yeah, okay, I, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. Arch archive stories are I've learned an important genre <laughs> that historians use to kind of talk about their work. So I could tell well, that, that. When I mentioned at the outset the labors involved, I mean, that was one of the things I thought about that, you know, all these different archives and archival staffs and archivists. I mean, in Latin America, there's a certain amount of schmoozing you have to do, even, <laughs> even sort of obsequious behavior <laughs> to get in the good graces of, an, of the, you know, the guy who runs the archive or the woman who does uh, to get done what you need to do. And I thought that in itself is an enormous investment of time. Maybe, it, well, maybe it's more streamlined in Europe, but then- uh, It depends. In it America, depends on the archives. It, it's stuff. a process. <laughs> yeah. Garrick. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, how did you select uh, the inventories? I mean, it strikes me as a potentially endless task. So the criteria for selection, and second of all, how did you choose the archives? Did it that, have to do with convenience of access or were there other criteria? The criteria were fair, were diverse and random. I mean, the, the project started in Switzerland and there I could access things pretty directly. Uh, and I worked in the, you know, Bern, Luzern and Zurich, the three big cantonal archives that have the relevant sources. I didn't work in Basel, although I certainly could have. Um, uh, but so there was a certain amount of convenience for the cases outside Switzerland. I mean, and I go to Switzerland often enough that I could cover the ground there. Um, the cases outside Switzerland are, were difficult to choose. And, and, and I have to say they're, they're just a scratch on the surface. And I was really lucky again in the ones that I bumped into. Um, one issue of course was language. I, I had to work in the archives where I had a solid gr grounding in the language, which meant Iberia, France, which I intended to go to, but ended up not using first-hand work in France, um, and the German countries. My Italian is dodgy. I probably, you know, I could have used Italian, but Italian archives are vast uh, and go back very early. And Filippo de Vivo was working on a grand project, first, first on Venice and then on a grand project. Uh, there was really good work, secondary literature I could use on, on uh, Italy. England is the other exception. I left England out. Uh, and the the answer there is, first of all, the English archival landscape is constructed very differently from the continent. Uh, it has really put together quite differently and diverged early. Uh, so it was a different language. And again, it's an enormous, extraordinarily dense archival landscape and has more literature about it. So I, I can't justify that exclusion, but you have one life and, and one set of languages and one set of time. Uh, so I ended up sticking to the continent and um, 
sort of de facto to what I tend to think of as the greater Habsburg sphere. And so starting from Switzerland, where the Habsburgs came from, you have Germany, the empire, Austria, their personal empire, Spain, where the Habsburgs of course landed. Uh, and I initially went to Portugal to follow tracks from Simancas because uh, one of the, again, one of those archive stories, a uh, little factoid that I found bumped across somewhere and then looked at in Simancas is that Philip II, when he became king of Portugal, and this was in 1580, he, uh, inherited the throne with the help, with the <clears throat> military backing, uh, his own military backing, but a disputed inheritance, but he inherited it. One of the first things he did when he got to Lisbon is he asked to see the archive. He asked to get a tour of the Torre de Tombo and was ex inordinately impressed by a set of registers, which are known as the Leitura Nova, uh, the new reading, which is an extraordinary set of illuminated uh, parchment registers. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know what a register is, registers are typically the, you know, the, they are like indexes. They are the driest part of the inventory. They're just lists of cross-references and terms. But the Portuguese had created a 60 volume set over 40 years of illuminated, uh, beautifully, uh, you know, with colored capitals and done on parchment is fantastic product of archival work. Uh, that when I ran into it, of course, I had to look at it, but it was just fantastic. So again, a certain amount of following one thing and finding something quite different happened to me over and over again. Uh, I, frankly, I mean, just one last point, just the, 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 the serendipity of historical research. Frankly, one reason I, try, I went, ended up in the Prince Bishopric of Würzburg uh, in uh, central, South Central Germany, um, I did want to include an ecclesiastical state. It made sense to me to ask, would the role, the influence of ecclesiastical archiving traditions affect the secular archiving of a, you know, a princely state that was headed by a bishop? But the other reason is that a friend of mine from my Romansch course 20 years earlier uh, was teaching at the University in Würzburg and said, come stay with me, you can stay in my apartment. <laughs> so I had free housing. Uh, when I got there, I discovered, again, one of these extraordinary projects, a uh, three volume and volumes this thick, you know, uh, uh, encyclopedic guide to the collected records of the Prince Bishop's secular administration, uh, of which there was also an illuminated parchment version, although it burned in 1574. So we only have the, the cheap version, the paper version that was kept in the, in the city archives. So there's a fair amount of luck. Uh, there is so much more to do on this approach of looking at these archives comparatively. And the older literature almost always was the history of one archive by its archivist. An enormously useful material, but the lack of cross-connecting made some really important patterns that were there and some that weren't, some, you know, some heterogeneity really visible that you just can't see if you look at this one at a time. That was a question. Sure. Yep. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, it, I can't help myself. I, I have to start with a comment, if I may, may. And then I have a rather specific question about one part of your book, uh, which I found uh, the book itself fascinating and the, uh, what I think your answer is. But I want to be, as a, the local medievalist, I want to presume to supplement in one respect the extraordinary, the wonderful introduction that, that Jim gave to you and your work. Um, Thanks to you, I've encountered this extraordinary young Portuguese scholar, uh, Filippa, whom I'll be talking about by Zoom at uh, what was the Huntington Seminar in, in, over the weekend. And um, I, I want to add that in the course of the work you've so eloquently and I think modestly but vividly described, uh, you have created a very, very important thing here. I mean, uh, there was going to be, I understand, a big conference here um, that got canceled because of COVID. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's. Uh, I, I salute you and congratulate you for what you've contributed, and and I kind of have perspective on what that is because, I've, as you know, I've been here even longer than you. So <laughs> yes, it's great to have you as a colleague. And now let me move on. Congratulations, a great celebration. And now, now I want to move on to my specific question. I mean, uh, as, as you probably know, I come at your area of interest from a completely different perspective, mostly the earlier part, 
in your, in, as I think I mentioned to you briefly in passing in the, er, in the first chapter or chapters, you make distinctions that I think really need to be made that I haven't seen made with that level of clarity before um, between what I think is now excessively called memory and knowledge and record and proof and archiving. Um, and uh, I suppose, uh, you, you know, I don't want to treat this as if it were a conference, but I am wondering where, where from your perspective, you today think the place of constructs such as collective memory is a virtual synonym for knowledge over time, where that is, and if you could add to that distinction at all. And if, if not, we can skip it, because I know that's not the venue, but I find it so interesting that I want to ask you that. Well, I only touch on that. And, you know, I know there's a, a, a large literature on various forms of collective memory. And clearly, um, archives are one node or concentrated site in that larger concern. Um, I've been cautious about making statements about the larger picture, whether it's the state or whether it's collective memory or whether it's about the reflexivity of historical research and the archives it takes place in, because I think this is, this book is really, I imagine this is sort of the first statement of, okay, we've gotten this far, now let's really dig in. Um, so I'm gonna be cautious about answering you directly. But the distinction, there are two points I would like to make about the language we use. And again, this terminology, which is not only is it not, we don't pay enough attention to this terminology, but it's used inconsistently and it's used differently by almost everyone, right? I mean, and I just, uh, one of the fields that has been growing sort of in parallel, this sort of my work grew along with this field, is one that really started out of Germany, uh, which they call Wissensgeschichte, so the history of knowledge or the history of information. Um, Princeton is about to publish a big fat companion to the history of information, uh, in which I have a chapter. Uh, so history of information has become a thing. And I'm not sure it was 10 years, certainly not 20 years ago, or it would, it would have been data processing, something like that. But who knows what, how, and what language we use is not yet firm. So, and I, my, in hindsight, I realized that the way I use the words is itself fairly idiosyncratic. So. Uh, one does have to be careful about this. But proof and information, archive, record, evidence, absolutely central word. We talk about historical evidence all the time. This gets to the reflexivity of the historian. Um, and one of the really big realizations that, you know, that would be my next book if I dare take on a next book, is how much our language of knowledge and of disciplined knowledge, historically disciplined knowledge, rests on legal terminology. It's the terminology of law. Fact is a legal term. Evidence is a legal term, right? All of these are legal terms. Information is a legal term. I mean, it's at least as medieval origins, right? And in turn, therefore, our whole construct of this web of connections that you raise, Piotr, and I completely agree, they're vitally important. Uh, and memoria is in a certain sense a legal term too, um, are deeply influenced by that set of ways of understanding the world that are shaped uh, in the record, especially by Roman law, right? Or by the reinvention, the re, re revivification of Roman law in the European Middle Ages. And it's why I started with two long chapters about medieval research. Uh, the Germans with their Wissensgeschichte, and before that, a, a group of scholars who did something they called pragmatische Schriftlichkeit, so pragmatic literacy uh, as a enormously important category that had been largely neglected before the 90s and 80s when they started on it. Um, but the other thing is that, so we have this language, the term archive, the, and, and I'm saying this not in the sense of Derrida and Foucault, but rather in the sense of historians and archival scientists, that is profoundly based on a European trajectory. And so when we go to, uh, I have colleagues now, you know, working on archives in China, archives in India, archives in Latin America, right? We should be very hesitant to <laughs> wait a second, are, are these archives? It's a question that the great Prussian Jewish archival theorist and, and arch archivist Ernst Posner, uh, who had to flee Germany in 1938, 
poses in his fantastic book, which is called Archives in the Ancient World. He says, how do we know these things are archives? Uh, his answer is not one that we would accept anymore, I think, because it's a very functional one. It's, they do the same work. Um, but the question is an enormously important one. And to understand European archives as historically contingent and situated with a trajectory of development in which words like archive, fact, evidence all change their meaning radically in some cases over time is a very important thing for me. I think we need to understand how provincial our own language of archives is as we work as historians. I think Alejandra has a question. Hi, everyone. Randy, it's so great to hear you talk about this project. I know uh, I've heard about it not that long, you know, since 2016, but we share an interest thinking about uh, information, thinking about what that means, <laughs> what is the history of information, what counts as information, what counts as knowledge, and all that. So it's um, it's delightful to see to get to see this project and friends and get to see you here talk about it. So I, I guess my question is a very general one, but and maybe an unfair one or just one that I know because we've talked about it, but part of the project, the way I understood it and the way I, I hear you talk about it is sort of you tracing the evolution of these terms, right? You tracing what is a record and how it's changing, how is it kept and what does that mean and what makes an archive an archive? And part of you is um, helping us both define those, but problematize those very definitions by showing us they're not constant, right? Like what we think of as the European archive is in fact this haphazard thing that is being created and recreated constantly. So I wanted, like, what was your takeaway from this experience as now you're seeing this world, as you're trying, as you're trying to create your archives for this book, as you're trying to model this information, how has it like helped you think about information and access, especially in this world. This is really open-ended. I just, I don't have a particular thing I'm looking for. I just, I know we riffed on this, but I'm, I always enjoy hearing you think a lot about this issue. Well, well, let me do two things with that, which, and I apologize for my dogs in the background that the gardeners are outside. There's nothing I can do to stop them. <laughs> so we're just gonna have to put up. Um, one is just to sketch out, you know, the very simplest version of what I guess is my argument of that evolution. And this is terribly schematic and, you know, Piotr will be able to tell you how schematic the medieval part is and so forth. Uh, but I do want to, to lay that out. And the second thing is to talk to your question really about contemporary issues of the inclusion of archives and so forth. And that's one, again, where I feel I still have a lot to learn from archival theorists at several different levels. I want to say a few words in praise of their work that I think all of us could learn from. Uh, as far as my sort of schematic model is that... Um, quintessentially the central high medieval record keeping, especially that on the part of sort of political records. Again, we have to, there's ecclesiastical records, there's commercial records, each have their own trajectory. But especially for those we would say the records of dominion, um, is that they, they are memories of acts. They are you know, the perpetual memory of a significant act. So they're tied very back, very much back to the actor. Right? And it is really that, that act which is then reproduced in different media. It is transmediated from charter, from act, from performance to document, to cardillary, to, you know, it can be repeatedly moved around, but it's focused on acts. By the late Middle Ages, and I'm not at all original in saying this, um, right? but what we see, especially with the uh, advent of paper as a cheap medium for recording, is that rulers of various sorts, and I really put the Inquisition against the Cathars as one of the sort of the originary points of this, begin to understand this toolkit they have, uh, which includes the book, right, the codex with its fantastic uh, capacity for organizing information, um, as about information, right? It is not simply memorializing acts, you actually want to know, right? So testimony, evidence, uh, cross-referencing, evidence through time becomes the central focus. And the way archivists respond to that, starting in the 15th century, is by organizing these rapidly growing masses of paper. And uh, I've just been reading a manuscript of a new book on the history of the information revolution by Paul Dover, which is gonna be very good, also coming out from Cambridge, uh, uh, which you know, tracks some of the explosives. But we're talking about you know, 300 fold increase in document production over a hundred years. <laughs> so you know, vast increases uh, so that, you know, 
the records keepers, the secretaries all over Europe by the mid, mid 15th century are talking about oceans of paper and you know, drowning in parchment and you know, metaphors like that. They're overwhelmed. And their response almost consistently is to connect documents to things in the world. So this is, this is docu the documents are, are, are organized in relationship to the world they describe, which makes perfect sense. And you know, for most of us, if we organize our papers, that's how we do it, right? makes perfect sense. Uh, they work at it and we get more and more sophisticated efforts to use both the architecture of spaces and buildings, but also the tools of indexing and registry uh, to manage. So these, if I wanna know about point X, I can find my way to it. And one of the high points of that, and it was, which is also the culmination of the fact that it doesn't work, is the great inquests that the Spanish crown orders in the late 16th century. Uh, these uh, questionnaires, you know, 100 questions sent to every township in the New World, 80 questions sent to every parish in, in metropolitan Spain. Vast amounts of these questionnaires come back and they never use them for anything because they view them as information about that parish and about that township and about that animal and about that, you know, right? Um, what is almost entirely missing at that point is this, is the aggregation of information that we take almost completely for granted, right? The formation of statistics out of information. And then in the 17th century, you start to see that shift. And in the realm, and this is the argument really of the article I wrote for that Princeton volume, in the area of political record keeping, what you see is that the focus of record keeping shifts from documents in relationship to the world to documents in relationship to state processes. In other words, things are filed depending on who, which office handles them and which, so, and this is the, the, the German term for this is registratur, but there's parallel developments all across Europe at this time. Documents are filed in relationship to their pathway through the administration. They come in, they're coded, they're sent to one office, they're sent to another office, they're sent to the prince's council for decision. They're sent, and each time they come back to the registry, the registry office, they're updated, they're given you know, the dorsal marks and various codes to show where they've been and who's looked at it. When it's done, that office sends out the reply into the world. And it took me until after this book was done, so this doesn't appear in the book, but it occurs to me that in that, that shift from documents in relationship to the world to documents in relationship to administrative process is where we see the thing we call the state becoming visible, becoming legible, becoming tangible. It's an invisible actor, imaginary actor, right? The state is not a real thing. It is an imaginary actor, but where does it appear? When the paperwork is always referring to this imaginary actor. So that's my big my argument there. So the archive made that makes the state real. I love it. <laughs> Almost, yeah. I'll, I'll send you. I can send you the galleys. You can decide whether I'm completely insane. Uh, so this was sort of the big take home that came out after it took. I had to finish the book to understand that, uh, or to at least to hypothesize that. Let's say. And I mean, again, I, I see this work as very preliminary in some ways because, you know, it's only the younger generation of historians who are, and I think very much because of the contemporary media revolution, right? are sensitized to these issues in a way that my generation never was. We simply, nobody talked about this in graduate school. I, you know, I, Piotr, Jim, Tom, did your, I mean, they may have told you how to use the archives, but to think about what is there? Why is it there? Why is what there is? Um, there's two major, well, like two major branches for me that are really important in current archival theory. One is something that I'm still processing called records continuum which is the idea that records are constantly moving through sort of growing spheres of connect connectivity. And there are certain sort of key processes. It's very hard to explain without the diagram, uh, but that, that, you know, the interpretation, the keeping and interpretation and pluralization, this is an Australian term of records, is an ongoing continuum rather than something that's done and done and done, you know, once and done. Uh, and this is a radical challenge to the canonical archive theory of the 20th century, which says once something crosses the archival threshold, it's in custody, it's locked up, right? And to think of archives as a continuum where documents can be in all sorts of different places and the contexts can, are continually changing is really a, a, a major challenge to older archival theory. The other place and that is intersects with this is the study of community archives, 
Uh, this started very much uh, in England. It was particularly African-American archives in the United States, African-American, gay and lesbian, indigenous, and, and probably theoretically the most influence has been from indigenous, the problems of archiving the uh, authentically ar recovering the, uh, the archival experience of indigenous peoples who were confronted with colonial regimes, right? And there's been some fantastic work on Canada and especially out of Australia dealing with the indigenous people there, rethinking about how we get at the knowledge or simply the conditions, right? If you think of archives as a way to see the past, how do we understand that past when one voice has always been systematically excluded? Right? So those are two really important intersecting ways of rethinking what archives do and what work they can accomplish. And I see that I have to call out Jorge here because I see he's here and you know, and he, his work is exactly an example of an archive that is not you know, anything like a traditional archive in terms of its authority structures, in terms of its custody, in terms of any of those things. Yet we can build an archive out of it, but we need to update theory to make to make sense of that. So I, I, I'll stop at that because I could ramble on for forever. <laughs> Thomas, is it? Tom. Thomas. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, sir. <laughs> there you go. It's much better for everyone if I'm muted. Um, Randy, I've been fascinated in this project and loved talking to you about this over the years. Um, and I have to confess, I, I haven't read the book. I need to read the book carefully. But I wonder if I could pose a question to you. So if I go into an English archive, uh, a local record office or something, they, they all now more or less follow the same pattern of organizing material. So you, you come in and you there's a family collection or there's a, a corporation town records and they all list things in various categories. And so you, it's very easy to fall into the rhythm about, it doesn't take long, you know, stuff I'm interested in is gonna be here and here. And, and sure enough, it is. And then the other pattern, and so I, I take that as the impact of archival training in the early and mid 20th century to go in this area, to go in that area. And undoubtedly it's inspired by following, I don't know, the French, I don't know who does it best in the- Hillary Jenkinson, Hillary Jenkinson. Okay, okay, well then it's that one. Um, and then you get to the pre things, if you go to like cathedral archives, or if you go to the Bodleian, which is just thrown in, there's a number attached to it and it's just random. And you have to swear, and pray that there's a really good uh, catalog guide because otherwise you're just summoning up things and the, and the, the three items a day rule will kill you. But, you know, it, so I, initially it seems like, oh, archives are simple. This, of course, it's a logical way of organizing it, but you know all the examples. Tell me, tell me one of the, the most, I, I'm not deprecating anyone else's, but the most unusual way of organizing materials that you found. <laughs> <laughs> the most unusual. You, know, so I mean, you told me the great story of one of the Swiss cantons, and they shifted the way they organized it all. Oh, well, yeah, that's, that, that, there's a story there, but I, I want to step a little bit back and say, I mean, there is a constraint on this. And, you know, there's, and you're really, your story uh, touches on, I would say, three different constraints, three, two or three different constraints. One, of course, is simply the amount of time that's been put in. And, you know, archivists' time is not free one way or another. Uh, so very often, you know, public records office are the result of the English having invested for 150 years in a more or less standardized scheme. Um, yeah. It is the case, if you look at France, which also has an even more standardized scheme, a, a true enlightenment monument uh, yeah. of categories and systems, and then you look at the catalogs of regional French archives, and they've just crammed stuff in, you know, into that system. So it may look ordered from the outside. I'm reminded for your, your craziest, craziest archive, this is actually not my work, but Simon Teuscher's. Uh, Simon Teuscher has found a genre of uh, late medieval law books. So compilations of, of the Schwabenspiegel and the, the Sachsenspiegel and other law books. So where these scribes would compile them. And he finds out that as far as he can tell, they compile them so that they look organized. Even though if you look at it more carefully, they're not organized at all. They're in fact, completely chaotic. Uh, and so he thinks it was mostly a sales technique. 
<laughs> wanted to get an indexed book because uh, you've got an indexed book. Wow, that's the best. Yeah, it's the new thing. <laughs> so, you know, um, this shift that, that ha happened in Switzerland uh, is exactly the shift I was talking about earlier about um, what you can, can say is world oriented to state oriented or archiving. And, and it's, it's, it was one of my early finds, not in the first article I did, but shortly after that, when I went and spent a lot of time on this major reorganization that took place in Lucerne in, in, in uh, 1698. It was never finished, by the way. So the way the Zurich archive, that very first book from Zurich, and I'm watching the time here, worked is basically the world was divided into categories of pertinence, of important things. And this was really important political actors. So the Holy Roman Emperor, and the Pope are important actors, and then the kings of various European states, and the cardinals, and then the dukes and high nobles, and the archbishops, and so forth. And the ar archive is literally mapped out like that. So you don't really need to, you don't need a catalog for an archive like that. You need to say, well, how important is the person I'm looking for? Well, then I know where to look, right? So it's entirely oriented towards an external systematic. And that, that there's a term, this is what Peter Rook had found out in Savoy in, in, in the 1440s. Uh, it's called ideal topographical. So there's a topography which is literally mapped to an ideal of the political world. And then that topography is reproduced in the pages of the inventory. So literally box one is for the emperor, page one of the inventory is for the emperor. And then yeah, there's the emperor out in the world. So in Lucerne, they tore that apart. And it's an extraordinary, I mean, this what archivists keep, one of these great mysteries. Why did especially European, but all archivists keep all this stuff? In 1698, they decide to completely redo this, the Lucerne city archive. This is a city state, has a territories, it's got administration. And they take everything apart. They put slips on the bundles. They kept the slips after the revision, right? Wow. And they create a new set of categories. First of all, they take all the old stuff and call it the old archive very modern move. This is the stuff that's dead. It's in custody. We keep it. It's important, but it's no longer active. And then the current archive to go forward was oriented not around this domain, this domain, this domain, this king, this king, this king, but about military affairs, church affairs, tax collection, administration of sub subject territories. In other words, the actions of the imaginary actor. Those are the groupings, right? And things are to be organized that way. And they create this fantastic cross-referencing system so they can find everything. Um, and then they never put the references. They set up the grid, they set up the system and never fill in the references. And there's this, this despairing uh, report by a outside expert who was brought in in the 1730s to, because of course it didn't work, right? To say, what should we do? And he says, it appears that the founder of this enterprise drawn away perhaps by business of state or perhaps he became ill or something because he never finished. <laughs> so uh, it's not the craziest organization, but it's one of those many stories that show how hard it was, how hard it was to conceptualize a clearer and more accessible way of managing. In fact, the idea that information was something you manage is what they had to work out. I mean, another one of these great mysteries, and Marcus Krajewski has a book about it, and, and uh, Alberto Cimellini is really doing fascinating stuff with this, including in England, is how long it took for the card catalog to emerge, right? We think of card catalogs as fairly straightforward and transparent and, and allowing us to do really clever things. There aren't any in Europe until well into the 17th century, late 17th century. It's just not a way of parcelizing information and making it part of a systemic hole that that occurred to people and it comes out of commonplace and comes out of humanist practice eventually i don't know if that answers your question yeah, yeah no thank you, thank you it's great okay sorry uh, what about uh you know you, you uh, there are no archives without archivists and uh, when i read the book i may have missed it I wondered how did these, they didn't call themselves archivists then, uh, record keepers, they're mainly scribes and secretaries as I remember. Secretary right? is usually yeah. the all-purpose term. Um, how did they become ones? How, how, was there an apprenticeship? Uh, how did they learn how to do this? And, and, and related to that, the diffusion of technology or at least practices, how did that That's happen or did, or, or did it happen given the variety of practices you, you, you document? That was one of my big questions actually early on in the, in the project. So the answer is in, in the high middle ages and Piotr can probably say much more about this than I do. Uh, archiving was done by clerics 
uh, either in, in royal, ducal, whatever service, but almost all the archiving was done by clerics. And there was a considerable circulation of techniques is that, that high medieval archiving is relatively consistent. They had a set, a toolkit, uh, and it was a lot of variation in the details, but they did it more or less as from the little I know. And again, I don't want to say too much, but it seemed to be fairly standardized, certainly in Switzerland. Um, Starting about 1400 in Switzerland, which is an observation I got from an article, an MA thesis actually, it was very interesting. Um, city clerks used to circulate, right? So there were there was becomes like this group of apprentices, often families, right? Father to son transmission of sort of town professional clerks, and they circulate from town to town, right? So again, there's some consistency. About 1450, that stops. You start a career in one place and you're not allowed to leave. You are too important to leave. You are paid well, you are supported, you are given uh, things, but you can't leave. So it is frequently family propinquity. By the early 16th century, you start getting university trained people who are brought in as secretaries. Uh, and then some of them turn out to be apt for um, managing the records and the ones who sort of choose to go in that direction. Uh, and then, but once they've done it, they're pretty much stuck with that, right? It's a uh, you do see this very interesting case, this fe amazing fellow called Wilhelm Putsch. Uh, he's an Austrian from the neighborhood of Innsbruck. He's employed in the chancery in um, Innsbruck, first as a, first he's a, just a clerk, and then he becomes a registrator. So a new office is emerging, the guy who registers, right? And there's a specialized routine for the production and, and registering of charters. So you have the scribes, the registrators, the, the compilers, secretaries or the clerks at the top. Uh, but so Putsch is really good at this and he gets assigned a family archive that comes into Innsbruck as territory. Uh, the, um, I'm blanking on the name of the family, but anyway, it's a big holdings down in South Tyrol and off into um, Slovenia. Uh, and he's told, make sense of this. And he creates a 1800 page index to this family archive. You know, and the line between family archives and state archives is completely blurry at that point. They really overlap. Uh, he's so good at this that he is then asked to make sense and create an inventory to the vaults, to the basement where the, the Habsburgs were keeping all of their administrative paper, the, uh, the archducal paper. Um, you know, Habsburg governance is complicated. Anyway, uh, and so he produces an index to that. And then he's taken to Vienna and told, can you do Vienna for us? So he is the author of these three massive, the first one is one volume, 1800 pages. The Innsbruck Putsch is five volumes, four volumes of inventory, and then an index to the inventory. And the Vienna is six volumes. So, you know, these enormous projects. At 1524 or so, he says, I'm working as registrator and as secretary, and I've given these projects I want to raise. And, and in his own, <laughs> the system that he sets up, there's the documents where the, the administrators in Innsbruck are asking the Holy Roman Emperor, Ferdinand, for permission to give this guy a big raise because we need him. <laughs> so they certainly had some leverage by that point. Uh, if you were good at this, there was a career path. Um, the first manuals for archival practice appear in the 1570s, 1580s, quite late actually. Uh, and by the early 18th century, late 17th century, you get real specialists, people oh, the, the formation of schools, uh, for example, in Coimbra in Portugal, to give a nice example. Uh, right around 1700, uh, graduates of Coimbra are given the monopoly on valid catalogs of noble holdings, you know, the tombos. Uh, only a Coimbra graduate can create a legitimate, uh, a valid tombo, which has to be then filed in the Royal Archive, the Torre de Tombos, right? Uh, in in uh, Germany, the German universities launch uh, degree tracks in Staatswissenschaft, state, state science, uh, which is basically a lot of it is, is, is record keeping. Uh, so you find this professionalization and, and by the late, by the mid 18th century, you get these guys who literally go from archive to archive. There's, I mean, these are stuff I didn't make it into the book. Uh, there's one that I would love to study. He, he worked around Linz in Austria and there's like 40 archives he's known to have organized. Guild archives, town archives, monastery archives, you know, princely archives, you yeah, name it. The wandering archivist. <laughs> the wandering archivist, yeah. <laughs> and the Theodists in France that Mark, uh, Marcus Friedrich is studying are much the same. Uh, very interesting. I have a question. 
So oh. you've got an archive and then you, so what is the, the archive is already organized or you have all this stuff and then you have to inventory and art. What, so you, what is an archive? What is an archive? What, what does it mean to say, we don't know in other, whether something's an archive or not. So what's the difference between an archive and a bunch of papers you haven't thrown away yet? Oh, that's, a, that's exactly a very, very important question. I make a distinction in the book just to keep my own head clear. Um, up until the 14th or 15th century, when what you did, wanted to do was memorialize acts, archives were viewed as a kind of treasury. And so the, the French royal collection famously is known as the Trésor de Chartres, the treasury of charters. And the Trésor de Chartres is kept in the Saint-Chapelle in Paris, right next to the treasury of jewels and the treasury of money. Right? It's a treasure of valuable things. Uh, is that an archive? I call it an archivum. I use the Latin term, which was quite rare before 1500. Um, the second phase is then when these secretarial offices stop being itinerant, first of all, and then start keeping track of paper for rulers who sometimes still are. So there's a lot of correspondence. We see the rise of diplomatic uh, correspondence explodes in the 15th century. So suddenly we have piles of stuff. And they're not archives. They're not called archives for a very long time. These are the offices of secretaries, the paper of the secretary, right? Uh, Spain is fairly early in calling these archives. So the Simancas is called an archivo by the, by the middle of the 16th century, uh, but that's unusual. And, and it's really a treasury, right? Simancas, uh, Charles V uh, establishes it, Philip II makes it work, but Simancas is established to lock up the papers, to get them out of circulation. And one of the lovely uh, archive stories that uh, Jose Luis uh, told me, uh, Philip sent a number of extremely important to him documents, and important to whom, right? Uh, to him documents to Simancas in chests, but he kept the keys with him in Madrid. So the archivist couldn't open the chest. <laughs> so it really is, we're locking this up. And it was family wills and family marriage contracts. Is that an archive? If the archivist can't see it, uh, good question. The modern sense of archive as the dead paperwork, the stuff that is no longer in use, uh, is really emerges as part of that, there's an archival revolution, we can say, that starts around 1780, but really gets going in the 18th, 19th century, uh, when you have the creation of state archives. And these state archives is where every actual government office, which itself is a product of the 18th and 19th century, can dump its old stuff. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the sort of the, Again, the short version archive story that captures that is the Haushofenstaats Archiv in Vienna. It's founded in, six, in the 1740s, very much in context of the succession conflict over the Habsburg Empire because Maria Theresa, a woman being the empress, but she can't be the Holy Roman Emperor, so there's a split there. Um, it's, it's proposed to her and approved by the state councils uh, as the house archive of the, arch of the Habsburgs for their treasure of charters. But once it's established, all of the ministries, the Habsburg ministries in Vienna say, okay, take this. <laughs> oh, finally, someone will take all this junk off our hands uh, and is completely overwhelmed and isn't able to do this idea of a lovely clean edition of all the charters or you know, preservation of all the charters. Um, so it's, it's a moving target and our modern sense of it is very much a product of the nation state in the 19th century. Uh, who can help with the, with the, the other distinction? This, this is a legal distinction. I, I will just one more word on this. Uh, about the same time, so late 17th, early 18th century, there's a kind of a, I found what I think is kind of a divergence and a debate. On the one hand, you have the people like Jean Mabillon, who founds the science of diplomatics, of authenticating old charters, right, which is what diplomatics is, who says you have to look very precisely, philologically, at the individual object in its context dates, itineraries of kings, signatures, all, you have to look at all the details to see if it's authentic or not. And that's very much a precursor of what we would call source criticism in a certain sense. At the same time, there's a much more obscure school of archival theorists in Germany. At Athanasius Fritsch is the best known of them, which is not at all. <laughs> and he proposes or codifies or organizes and expresses in a series of treatises what he calls the jus archivi, the law of archives. And there the principle is very simple. To have an archive, you have to be a sovereign. And if you're not a sovereign, you have a chest of documents. 
That's the difference. And the authentication comes not from the things themselves. It doesn't, they don't dismiss that, but it's not the final straw. The final criterion of authentication is, is it held by a sovereign, properly held by a sovereign? So sovereignty, which itself is, you know, a 17th and 18th century concept becomes the touchstone of who can have an archive because an archive carries by that point authority, right? It's a source of authority and power. I packed a lot into that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I, I loved your, it, there are only a few pages in the book, but your, your, your portrait of Philip II, it captured you know, in this, his sort of the ultimate micromanaging king to create a more uh, sort of comprehensive royal archive in Simancas, uh, it, yeah, again, it fit perfectly my image of them. I, I wondered, uh, I saw in your, your archive cited uh, page, uh, the Archivo de, de las Indias in Seville, the colonial archive was cited. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Is there any indication that uh, Philip II ever, con that's not established until, well, you mentioned your book, until the Bourbon reforms, Charles III, I guess. The late 1780s, 18th. it's remarkably late, right? Yeah. It, it really yeah. fits into the Sorry, any indication he ever thought of that, you know, given, uh, again, the, the, the micromanager that and Spanish Empire is at the height of his, of his influence, that he ever contemplated a separate archive? I mean, all the stuff, the colonial stuff was in Simancas, right? They had to move that eventually. Well, you know. it, I, I went to the Seville to track the movement from Simancas. That was what I was interested in, is, you know, this shift from the Simancas context to a new synthetic archive, which is the Archivo de Indios. But the, the, the core of the Archivo de Indios is the collections from Cartagena and Seville themselves, mm -hmm. the Casa de Casa Contratación. Right, and that right. was a self-contained yeah, repository separate. where things accumulated more or less naturally in the process of colonial governance. And there was certainly communication between Madrid and, and, and the Casa, but the Casa had its kind of records. And then the Consejo de Indias, the council in Madrid had its records. Uh, and the Consejo sent its records when they were done with them to, to Simancas. So that, that's what, and those records then went from Simancas to Seville in 1770s. And then there's quite a bit of documentation. We literally know how many mules it took to move the you know, <laughs> 170 mules worth of material that went from Simancas to, to uh, Seville, at least in one of those shipments. Uh, the, the, one of the things that are the tragedy of Simancas, and which fits with this story of that the, those amazing questionnaires were never used, is that by the 1630s, it was impossible to find anything in Simancas. Hmm. It, the indexing and the cataloging, they had invested in the building. Philip II had invested in the building, but he never really invested in enough people to make it work. Uh -huh. uh, and the people there were very isolated. It's the Ayala family, it becomes hereditary. So Diego de Ayala is the first archivist. He's really a brilliant guy, but his sons are pretty lazy. And so they do a, this classic Spanish imperial thing. They do a visita in 1626, I think. And then the visitador dies and his son takes it over, which tells you something about Spanish bureaucracy. Anyway, his son goes in there, a guy called Diego Hoyos. And he says, I can't find anything. It's just, it's completely chaotic. And he makes, he actually makes kind of a, rough and ready inventory so he can at least figure out where the stuff is, right? He just goes around and says, okay, in this room, there's these things. And that's the best inventory we have for the early 17th century. And they don't really start inventories again until the 18th century. And the, the people who were sent by, I, I'm blanking on the name of the historian who, uh, Galvez, Galvez, right? Who was Philip, uh, Philip the, whatever the king, whichever king it was, who was a Carlos, wasn't it? One of those guys. <laughs> I don't know my 18th century Spanish kings. Galvez, Galvez, yeah. Galvez. Galvez, you know, he sends teams of clerks and secretaries to Simancas and they say, oh my God, this place is a disaster. Fascinating, pretty interesting. So the current order we see now is the result of a vast investment of work since then, since the 19th century. Okay. But nation states create national archives and they're a completely different animal to go back to George's question from these dynamic collections, ongoing repositories that emerge and sort of evolve, right? They, they simply evolve in the 15th to, to 18th century. No, no brilliant book, Randy. Fascinating. <laughs> I, 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 scratching the surface, opening the questions, getting historians to think about this stuff and to recognize, again, I think one lesson for historians not of early modern Europe, which most of you aren't, is to be aware of just how deeply that 
those legal concepts have squirreled their way into record keeping language and even historiographical language, right? The forensic model is, is deeper and stronger and it's built into our notion of what archives are and how we use them. And you, you had to engage a lot of the archival theory in your work or? or, or not? As I went along, it took, me, it took me unconscionably long to recognize how important it was. But the last couple of years of the book, when I was rewriting it and weaving it together, uh, it was in my mind. And really, again, moving forward, I think that the, particularly the, the Australian archival theory, the records continuum stuff, it needs, it's, it's written, it's designed and worked out by these you know, Terry Cook, Suma Kemish, Angela Land, really good people who have uh, figured it out, but they're record keepers, right? They run archives, <laughs> they're archivists. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be translated into historic historian talk, I think. It needs to be translated to be, to be mobilized for historians. So if, if, if I have one more smaller project, it might be to try to take on, first of all, to figure out records continuum theory, because it's not very clear to the historian, and then to try to make it more, more clear. But it clearly has to do about this, the constant recontextualization. And I'm finding this enormous, just one last word about current projects. So I'm working now on a paper, several versions, but, but about how the Zurich Reformation was archived and how sort of the Reformation with the reformers is a product of ongoing archival reorganization over the centuries. You know, so I particularly looking at ret letters, we have thousands and thousands of letters from the Reformation, but they've been continually reframed and recontextualized. And the letter writ that, you know, the messenger gives to you is read inevitably in a very different way than the letter you look up in a manuscript register and that's very different than the letter you read by clicking in a database that shows the author's network of connections. It's the same text, but almost everything else about it is different. And once we recognize that, then I think we start realizing there's an absolutely um, brilliant book by my colleague, Jesse Blank, you know, brain freeze from Washington State uh, that takes what is, has long been treated as the original religious confession of the Dutch reformed church the convent of Wesel. And he picks at the archival threads and picks and picks back to where he can say, first of all, this was not a religious statement of religious doctrine. There was no convent of Wesel. Uh, it was something completely different that was essentially invented by not falsification, but by simply by the recontextualization by 17th and 18th century archivists. So, you know, facts turn out to have been constructed by archivists, not, you know, and this is at, at the level of archival practice, not at the level of document practice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, Randy, as a class to teach, uh, George, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm sure we all have lots of other questions, but we'll let you go and get ready for class. Okay, okay. That was fascinating. Thank, Thank you so you. much. And Thank you, Jim. Uh, and, uh, Thank you all for coming. I'm very grateful. Herzlich and Dank, we have at least one person from Switzerland. I'm uh, just touched and amazed uh, and uh, appreciate your being here. Thanks a Thank lot. Thank you. Man. See you all. Mm -hmm. Hey, Georgia. Tom. Bye. Dana, Bye. all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye. I can't chat, so. Bye. <laughs>